to Human Tech, a podcast about the intersection between humans and technology. My name is Guthrie. I'm here with Susan. Hello, Susan. Hey, Guthrie. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm excited about our topic today, uh, yeah. which is going to be, I don't know, You want? is it called Industrial Design? Is that its official title? Yeah, I guess so. Industrial Design, you know, it's the, it's all about the design and the human factors of designing physical stuff. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of the times, a lot of the work that you and I do is uh, designing digital, right? And designing software and designing apps and designing websites and all the user experience issues around design of digital things. But there is a whole world of the user experience of designing physical things and um well beyond but and even beyond physical okay if it's not digital and it's not physical (laughs) no 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 um (laughs) is there is there is there i mean i know there's virtual reality but is there some some other uh aspect of reality that i missed (laughs) in my career uh it's funny because nvidia just had a keynote that i watched yesterday in which so we know about facebook now meta they have the metaverse yeah NVIDIA has now announced the Omniverse. Okay. And what's the so, Omniverse? Oh, I don't even want to know. No, no, I'll tell, I'll tell you because you'll, you'll like this. We, we're not going to do the podcast about it. Okay. Okay. So imagine trying to predict what an accident is going to occur. Yes. Right? Using yes. AI, machine learning yes. stuff on a, on a GPU, ideally, right? That's because it's yeah. NVIDIA. That's sort of the thing. Yeah. Okay. So how, it, it's one thing to have a chip in a car, self-driving car, that's like, oh, where is it, right? So what the Omniverse does is, this is, this is like a theoretical use case, okay? Imagine all the cars transmit all of their data to one central server, and the server has, is made, has an exact replica of every single street in America and it's running all the cars, all the data from all the cars at all at all times, and it's getting the sonar data for everywhere. So essentially, in real time, you have, in theory, a accurate representation of all the traffic all at the same time. And then, therefore, you can predict where uh, accidents are going to occur, like because you know that the like there's a car coming this way but you like know it before your local car even can spot it. So basically the idea is you can get more contextual information if you are running a simulation of real life in real time alongside um, the, the, the software that's running locally or a warehouse would be another version, right? Every single um, uh, 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 little bot in the warehouse you know, it has AI that tells it where to go, but there's but you're running an omniverse simulation of all the bots, and so you sort of know all the problems before the local I love bot even. This. Gets. this is great. You love this. I love this. Isn't that cool? This is this is very cool because it has to, which is, and this is not the topic of today's podcast. No, but we'll maybe we'll do it the next one. It's temporarily the topic. I love it because it's the it's. It's predicting the future, the very, yes. very near future. And I, and it's it, through a combination of uh, physical reality and then, uh, you know, digital simulation. So um, I think that's, I, I think that's really interesting. The, the privacy stuff with the car is maybe not great, but the warehouse, it makes a little more sense, right? It where all you, makes sense. Where it you have basically a 3D representation yeah, of the have, entire you warehouse. You have what's and, happening right now physically, and then based on all the data points. Yeah, I love it. I Maybe I want to shift careers. I want to work in that space. All right, but that's not what we're talking about today. No, but the, the, the point being... So you I have... think that's that's more important than the <coughs> metaverse. The omniverse. The no, omniverse. You, you said what other what other realities are there? There are new realities Apparently, coming up every day. I'm I I've been asleep. <laughs> I've not been paying attention, and I'm really glad that you pay attention for me and bring these things to me. Yeah. But that's um, not what we're talking about. Today. No. So, so what I meant specifically is there is like so everything has a user interface, right? whether you design or not, blah, 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 that old adage. 
Um, but there is also. I like how you just summed up my whole career into <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That's great. <laughs> That's great. <coughs> my entire career uh, is blah, blah, blah. You've done such a good job explaining it. That it's now just blah, blah, blah. That it's blah. now. <laughs> Blah, All right, blah, anyway, blah. go ahead. So we have the blah, blah, blah. Um, Everything has a user interface. But 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 beyond just the design, the, the, the UX of a physical good, because you can, I want to, because there is a, you can apply UCD, the user-centered design process, to a physical good. Nothing is stopping you from doing the exact same stuff you would do when you design a mobile app and just do it when you're designing a toaster, blah, blah, blah. So. Yes. But but I want to, but this topic specifically today is about it's almost like information architecture, in which um, we've talked to some information architecture experts, and like they do seventy five eighty percent of the exact same things that a UX you know professional is doing. There's they all have different names. Yeah, the they, the department in the schools is different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the you know the methodology is different, but like basically, it's like the exact same thing. And I wanted to talk about. Um, they would argue with you about that, but okay. What would they argue? Oh, it's a, that's another digression. But go go back. Okay, fine. I'm sorry to all the information architects. You yeah, are really, UXers. Really. You're they doing the. You're, they can't hear this apology because they turned off the podcast. <laughs> they heard you say that and they said, I'm not listening to these people anymore. So, so I mean, all I would say to the information architects, so you don't talk to users? You don't think about things okay, from, a, from the user's it. perspective? You, you, they're, it's, they're, it's, you know, it's, Keep going. So there's a have, are you writing down all the things we're going to talk about in future podcasts? Because our, our podcast list is just one. like enemies how to make in the industry. Info, how is hey, I different? really like waterfall. Let's talk about how great the waterfall <laughs> process is. Okay, you better write these down. We'll talk about how great waterfall is. Uh -huh, we'll talk yep. about information. Are, are you writing this down? We'll talk <laughs> about information architecture versus yeah. you, is the same as or different from UX. Uh -huh. All right. Now, what, what? where were you going with this? What, dear listeners, at some point we will get to today's topic. Maybe. We're, no, no, no. But but this is this is all this is all important. So, well, the omniverse stuff was not important, but it was just a fun digression. So, just like there's that universe, there is a industrial design, like from a manufacturing back from the aerospace more more um more engineering focused world uh that this comes that 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 exists and they're like it's like it's again it's like you're doing a lot of the the, the ux stuff you're doing so, sort of the same thing but it's totally different and the methodology is different and the way you talk about things is different um and i wanted to talk about that universe today which you called well, it was an interesting. You said, design. "What do we call this?" And I was like, um, "We could call it human factors in industrial design. Uh, we could call, you know." So, in fact, we can talk about terms. We can talk about the term ergonomics and whether that describes it or not. Um, so, I, I think to talk about it, there's some splits you have to make. So. First of all, we can talk about the design of, of digital interfaces versus the design of physical interfaces. And so we can, we can talk about it that way, but then we can also talk about it uh, in terms of mm, cognitive versus uh, 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 manual. Okay. That was not clear to you, but it helped order <laughs> things in my brain. <laughs> All right. So let I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to go back in time and then we'll go off on all these branches. So first of all, realize that for well, those of us. Okay. Oh, not going I, to I, I found it. I found it. I've been, I've been looking. I've you been found looking. what? So the epitome of this field, in my mm. opinion, comes from. The University of, can you guess the university I'm thinking Maryland. of? Maryland. No. 
That's what? maybe I don't know about Maryland. I was gonna say Michigan. No. Because be- well, I, I only say because you can get a master's there. Yes. Um, in industrial systems and engineering. You can which get a is, mas- Yeah, but you can get that master's in a lot of places. But but that's sort of that that is so so like for example, you know there is a human factors ergonomics course. Yes. There. Right. And that that was like what I was talking about, because it's in the engineering school. Yes. It literally is talking about human factors. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's a different world. So what's this thing going on at Maryland? Um, well, University of Maryland was one of the early places doing, uh, uh, you know, ergonomics as well. So let, okay. all right. Sorry for interrupting. You go back. That's to all right. I'm going to let's take a time journey back in time to when the dinosaurs roamed. Uh, maybe not that far back. So if you work today or you're interested today in the field of user experience, we tend to think of that as being the design of screens and pages and apps and software and websites and voice interfaces, and it is all that. But before there was user experience, uh, there was something called human factors. And bef- and there was human factors in computer systems. And this goes back to about the mid-1980s. Um, and, and that's kind of what it was called. But before it was human factors in computer systems or human factors in software, there was just human factors. And most of the work that was being done was about designing the user experience of physical objects. This included cars. Uh, So, you know, there's been... uh, That's the history of the Michigan one, because Michigan, Detroit, all the automakers are making dashboards. uh, There there have been people working on, you know, the design of dashboards and buttons and controlling the radio and the temperature dials. and uh, dials and the steering wheel and you know all of those things that's been going on a long time but there's a history that that predates that um, because really the typical story that's told is that that uh, the history of well there's multiple stories some people say it goes back to World War II. Um, It goes back to the design of airplane cockpits. Uh, There are uh, famous stories. um, Actually, you know, one of the things I like to do is go back and and investigate these famous stories and see if any of them are true. And I haven't investigated this one, so I'll tell the story. But then now I'm going to have to go investigate it and give an update. But the, the, the story that's told, whether true or not, is that during World War II, the uh, uh, planes being used, you know, in in battle, in air fights around Europe, uh, there was uh, you pushed one button to drop the bomb, and you pushed another button to eject yourself from the pilot seat if your plane was going down, and that. Uh, because of where the buttons were and how big they were and so on, the people would accidentally press the wrong buttons and they'd eject themselves when they didn't mean to. And, and, and so uh, the airplane engineers um, called in, uh, uh, and they, they were trained. They were trained in simulators about which button was which. Uh, and in training, they did fine, but in the stress of the situation, they would press the wrong button. Again, I don't know if this is true. I'll go check it. But certainly, uh, and that, that that they brought in psychologists to work with the engineers to figure out what to do about the buttons. But that's even the cognitive part of hardware. So I would split this whole idea about human factors in ergonomics into two pieces. One is the purely physical part. So the question is, you're designing... Uh, a dial, and I know that, you know, nowadays it might not be a dial, but back then it was, you're designing a dial, let's say, for, to change the radio station in the car. You're designing a dial to, to, to change the volume on your, 
uh, stereo receiver. Um, there are a lot of dials in the world. There's a lot of dials in the manufacturing world. How big should the dial be? Should it be, you know, three inches in diameter, one inch in diameter, five inches in diameter? And not only that, when I turn the dial, if I turn it a quarter turn, should that be 25% of the total options in, in terms of the, what the measurement is going to be? Or should a 25% turn be larger or smaller? I mean, these are, these are what's considered ergonomic questions. And some of them are purely physical based on, you know, in terms of that size of the dial, well, there's all kinds of data that have been collected for literally decades, probably going back to around the 1940s, about the average size of a human hand and the average reach of human fingers and how far, you know, the, does your index finger move versus your thumb? How, how uh, what's the average length of the arm? Um, and therefore, you know, how far away should someone be? So there's been an enormous amount of data collected over decades uh, about this. And there are, um, there are books that you can buy that have, you know, all the data. That data had to be updated because interestingly, most of the data that was collected was on uh, men because, um, it, you know, back in the years ago, most of the people in the workforce that, that were working in a factory, a lot of them were men or whatever, whatever reason they well, based it on. Well, in the 40s, I would imagine the mass. 40s, it would be a lot of women because the men. No, no, well, no, 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 no. In the 40s, the, I'm, I'm thinking like after the war, you know, like late yeah. 40s. Probably the majority of drivers were also men. So the yes, yes, so a lot, men. right, right. Yeah. So they've it's been it's been updated. You know, now there are tables in these books. It's like for men and for women, and you know, there's all kinds of data because you can't you don't want to just do the average, right? You want to do the median, and you know, so so it's Some actually states you can drive at fourteen and a half. So if, what? Some states you can drive at 14 and a half. <laughs> so if you are going to be designing something that has a dial, you can go look up, you know, what the what the guidelines are uh, about all of these types of controls. And it's dials and sliders and uh, the size of that buttons, physical buttons should be, um, to, you know, based on different criteria. And there is an entire world of this. There's an entire world of this. And I think for those of us who work primarily in digital space, you know, we don't realize that there is a whole, a whole world and a whole science and a whole body of knowledge. And it's been around much longer than, than UX is. And I think the other thing that comes into play here that I find interesting is we've gone full circle in design and a lot of times we are designing, I, we have, Guthrie, you and I have more and more clients who are designing, if not entirely a physical device, they're now designing a combination of digital well, physical. So for example, there's a couple of great examples. Uh, a lot of modern cars have forgone all the physical dials and knobs. And I now just have a big screen to control these things, but you're still like in a car, right? So the ergonomics of being able to touch a display is important, but it's now a digital display that they're touching. And you know, like there's a, it's a, it's a screen with a slider instead of a physical knob. And by the way, most people seem to very much not like those, but whatever. Um, so yeah, yes, I, I if, if, if nothing, else, even if you even, but see, here's the thing that I find interesting, even, because I find with our clients recently, I've had conversations I, where I've said, okay, you need to go look up the data on, because even though they are designing a lot of digital products, they are now designing digital products that are being used in particular physical contexts. And just the fact, just the fact, you know, we all got used to designing keyboards and 
mice and trackpads. And that whole thing got fairly standardized. Uh, not exactly, but, you know, fairly standardized. But if we're talking now about designing things for phones, um, you know, there is a whole ergonomics that you do have to think about, especially as the phones get bigger. Foldable. You know, this, foldable. Or just bigger, like this idea that, oh, well, someone will hold it in one hand because there's something else they have to do with the other hand. Okay, so does that mean that you're expecting them to use their thumb? Because, you know, the, th the thumb can't reach everywhere. If you have a small thumb, like my thumb is not very long, I, I can't reach everywhere. And even if you have a bigger thumb, if the phone gets bigger, you can't reach any. These things come into play. Uh, if you're going to be doing, you know, uh, some kind of augmented reality and you're holding the phone out or you're holding the phone up, how long can someone how heavy do that? So my That's phone, heavy. my phone right here, this is a Samsung uh, Ultra. It is a heavy phone. It's a heavy phone. Yeah. yeah. So how long are you going to be wanting to hold it in one hand and you're trying to do something else at the same time or hold it up or hold it out? Um, so I've been having more and more conversations with our clients about, okay, Go look up what the research says, you know, about this or that. So I think like even half a pound. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a lot. Well, it's a holding lot. it up, you know, that's. Especially with one hand and while you're trying to do something else. And, and as, as we have gotten more sophisticated in the types of apps we're creating, the, the need to, to create apps that are being used in complicated physical context um, is increasing. Medical devices for sure have, have been that way for a long time. So, um, you know, whether you're, even if you're not designing purely a physical uh, object, like we were talking about that has dials and, and so on, uh, you still might need to, to be up a little bit on, on the ergonomics. And, um, I, I don't know, Guthrie, do you think, I, is this a trend yet or is it going to be a trend? I don't, I honestly don't know. You know, you said, oh, people hate, you know, using the screens and the cars. It, you know how uh, there's this whole thing about going back to like vinyl records and so, do you think that in some situations it will become more aesthetically pleasing to go back to dials and therefore this whole need to, to understand how to, how to, uh, design, you know, dials and buttons and sliders that are physical will come back. Yes. Um, yes, sure. I'm, I'm just wondering if that's, yeah. you know, it's, we went, we went full screen for so much and now maybe we're well, we really haven't that. you we like you say that screen. well you know I, it's true it's true but you know if you think about I, can, can, well hold on can i, yeah. I I'll, I'll give you some thoughts yeah the first is that what the reality is is that it will become cheaper to just use a screen than to have buttons so buttons and dials will become a premium product. Well, yes. I mean, because. And that and that may, that's what will hurt it. Yeah. Well, that's what has hurt it because you, you can swap out the software on the screen. You know, you can do a download and get a new software on the screen, but you can't swap out dials that way. Well, no, no, no. But like. And they're expensive to create. I'm just I'm just talking about we're trying to keep the cost of the car dashboard down. Yeah. Well, we need a screen for navigation. So why not also do the screen for the AC and then we don't need like we can eliminate parts and yeah. we can that's I think that's more the pressure. And also yeah. right now it's cool. I, I think in the future um, people will like dials. 
but it is possible to, okay. Oh my God, this is really, really complicated. So the reason that dials are so good is because of the haptic feedback. So yes. uh, if you turn a dial, especially in a car, a good dial, there are clicks, there are things. It's not- You feel, and you might not hear it, but you feel it. You feel it, and you may not even realize you're feel feeling it, increments. but you feel it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're pressing a button, you can feel the spring click That's into right. place. That's so right. there's a, ha there's a um, the, most, the most important ones, of course, is a keyboard which are not going anywhere. And in fact, people are getting really excited about key keyboards. People are spending tremendous amounts of money on making custom keyboards and key switches and clickies and the whole thing. And it's all about tactile feel. So there is a whole tactile feel thing going on. Um, you know, ASMR is everywhere. It, there, people really like the tactileness of it. That said, there are ways to simulate that with digital stuff. The current way isn't perfect okay so like just just like a cheap screen that you slide across is bad but for example um apple who know they know what they're doing on newer macbooks the when you press the trackpad to click before there used to be a little physical right it would actually click they got rid of the click for simplicity but what happens is when when it detects enough force there is a tap they call it the taptic engine that a rumbles taptic, did they did they invent that taptic engine i'm pretty sure that's what they call it okay maybe they call it the haptic engine but i think it's the taptic engine because <laughs> you're tapping it i don't know <laughs> anyways or maybe i'm wrong i should probably look that up that was my recollection Anyways, so what happens is when it when it detects force, it has a it has a way of measuring you know how strong you're pressing. When you pass the threshold, there is a very high quality vibration that happens just at the perfect length that one would be used to clicking a button, and so it feels tight, it feels crisp, and so when you when you push, you have that nice doot doot doot. Yeah, and it feels like you're clicking, even though there's actually no spring mechanism yeah. inside. And one could imagine um, in the future a whole a, a lot of other ways to have that sort of uh, feedback in a in a uh, in a in a device that satisfies that sort of oh, instant I, whatever. I think this is critical. You know, think back on it. I mean, years and years and years ago, and, and you know, you may remember, you may be old enough to remember some of this. I'm not sure. I certainly am. I can even can remember years before. Just think about the visual quality of what you were looking at on oh, a computer screen. It, it, even if it rainy. was just... Just Blue. words. I'm not even talking about graphics oh, sure. I'm just, or emotion or animation. I'm just talking about words, right? Yeah. And and not you clear. know, then we and we obviously got more sophisticated in our ability to show things visually, and that was it deemed to be very important that that we improve that. The same has been true about sound. Okay, computer sounds. Uh, not just voice interfaces, but just tones and, um, uh, can, you know. Can you remember yes, when all the of it? I remember all of it. Said, let's let's have a modem, and we'll just make the noises come out of the modem. What do you mean? The the modem sounds. Of course, I remember modem sounds. But I, what do you but mean? No, no, no. But the idea that you design a product and it's like, what should it sound like when it's connecting to the internet? These things are These things are important that the sound, the, it's feedback. The kids don't know what I'm talking about. No, they don't. Listen. But, but the, no, but just the idea that you would design a product and that was the sound that the product should make. I don't think that was came from the ux team I, i'm sure that, that was an engineering decision it might have been an engineering decision but nowadays the sound 
the sounds do come from the UX team. Well, that's what I'm I, saying. Especially I, like Windows 11, they have I, done a lot well, of well, work. Even for a particular, there, you know, I I did work recently for one of our clients where we put together a sound library for an app. So, you know, you have your app and what sound should it make when you just want to give some feedback that the the action they took has been heard and is completed. What sound should it be when it's a notification or when it's an alert or when it's this or when it's that? How many things should have sound? What should those sounds be? And there is an entire, another, I love the phrase entire body of knowledge. Apparently that's all I say all the time, but there's an entire body of knowledge about sounds and how long should the sound be? What pitch it should be? Uh, the quality of the sound. Um, it, there, there's a lot, a lot of people doing a lot of research on this. And in this one project I'm thinking about, we actually then did user testing on sounds. We had, you know, the different possible sounds, and we did user testing, and people got to, uh, you know, say, oh, you know, the, oh, I think that sound is means this, or that sound is too long or that sound is annoying. And um, so that whole world, right? So we went from really caring about visually what things look like, and then also really caring about the sounds. And now, you know, we all, not now, but along with it, and maybe lagging a little bit behind those are the haptics. What should mm -hmm. things feel like? And, and how and how quickly do they respond? How quickly do they respond? Because how long is the response? What does the response this, feel like? This is actually really important, and I know this because I I play video games, and so I'm aware of the sci of, of some of the science behind it. Because there's a whole world of, you know, if you're playing video games professionally, which I do not do, but there is, you know, people are much like in the back in the day when you were racing cars right like how can we get the car to go as fast as possible that sort of ingenuity trickles down into the mainstream through advancements that's sort of how things work so there is a certain category of professional game you know gamer where every millisecond that you can shave off of delay can increase the reaction time they have and make them a better player so there's sort of a quest to make the equipment better on a very high end and that sort of trickles down uh, underneath. So back, you know, think of like a really crappy touchscreen if you've ever used one. Mm -hmm. Not like so crappy that it was like, you know, like cell phones in the mid 2000s where there was like the plastic screens and like there was like an obvious delay or like a Palm Pilot or something like that. Think, think, but, but just like a normal, like the cheapest tablet you've ever used or something. Like, you click on something and it feels like you're clicking, but what you don't realize is that there are milliseconds of delay. When you use a computer, there's between you moving your mouse and when the cursor moves on the screen, on a bad display, it can be 200, 300 milliseconds, which is quite a long time. You're not gonna realize, you don't, you don't realize how long it is, but it's really quite long, whereas, in a in like in a whole setup, you know, you can get that down to like 20 milliseconds, which to your brain feels much more instantaneous. And I, um, they've really been doing it on smartphones to increase the. And it's like it's weird. It's like it's like you don't notice it, but it's like it feels snappy. It feels responsive. It's like this, like this ethereal thing that you can't quite play. And just, it's more pleasant to use. And um, I wonder if part of the, uh, part of the, of the solution, or maybe part of the problem, it's the same thing, about why using screens has not been as satisfying as physical objects is because when you touch something physically, there is zero lag, there's zero response, it's that instantaneous uh, feedback that you're getting like live as you go. I have um, heard people who use the uh, Apple Pencil and the iPad Pro. Um, we have a friend 
uh, who is, you know, sort of a graphic designer and like every graphic designer you've ever met. It's like, well, like what they have all those things like, well, what do you use to like create? And they're like, I use an iPad and an Apple pencil and they all use the same thing. But Apple has done a ton of work really reducing the latency between that so that when you oh, draw yeah. if the it, latency is wrong it, it's but, but we're talking like even just shaving a couple very, milliseconds off very, it's very small. makes a big difference but there are times when you want you might want to increase a delay i mean it's not always it has to do but not on like with, a slider. No, no. With the with the drawing, and I, I can see that you'd want to. You definitely. Or I meant like um, think of like a, a a slider in a car that you, where you set the temperature right and yeah. you slide it back and forth. You want that slider to be instantaneous that just follows your finger. I feel like I would be more okay using yes. a slider on the car if it was just like literally just followed your finger wherever yes. your finger went. Yes. Instead of feeling kludgy. Yeah, yeah, no, it it's true, and and uh, a small a small change can make a big difference. And you know, part of this is because we are we are used to navigating in the physical world. You know, we're used to taking our finger and moving something on our desk, and it moves. You know, it doesn't like sit there for a second and then move, right? It moves in what we would consider real time. So, yeah, these things are important. And I think, you know, I mean, haptics has been a been a big field for a very long time. But I, I think it too um, is growing is growing in importance. So, yeah, you know, okay. Can I just take a momentary, uh, possibly useless aside? here um, about haptics, uh, about the future. Because, Guthrie, uh, we, ha we have a friend, and you may not know who this is, but do you know this person? Maybe you know who this is. Maybe you'll remember. Years and years ago, um, she was designing the cockpit work. She was on the team that was designing the cockpit for the um, shuttle the space shuttle. Do you remember the space shuttle? Mm. Do people remember the space shuttle? Uh, by the way, um, we have this this lovely message. Yes. What is it? I put it on the screen. Uh, someone writing in that Adobe has a feature to slow the response of the pencil to help reduce errors. Ooh, see, mm. I told you. Sometimes you want it to slow down. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm not an expert on any of this, so. Um, uh, this is what our friend, my friend always said to me, do you know what happens if you are in zero gravity and you push a button on the space shuttle? You, you eject into space? No, you're inside the space shuttle. You're not ejecting. But the button doesn't go in. You go to the other side of the room. So I just thought that was fun. I always thought that was fun. <laughs> so they had a dude totally. You're in zero gravity. Yeah. Right. Cool. So you can't put, you push oh, a button, you, it moves you. Also, her comment was, do you know how big those gloves are that they're wearing on the space shuttle? They're like this big. So the buttons that would have to be like this big. I, I always like those stories. The, the you know, again, uh, context Context is everything when you're doing this stuff. All right. I have another question for you. And I mean this seriously, although you're going to think it sounds silly. So if we think about it, we've made all these strides with visual. We've made all these strides with auditory. We've made, we're making strides with haptic. And you know where I'm going next on this, right? No, go for it. Uh, taste and smell. Well, okay. So, so do you, I mean, should, should we be licking the knobs in our cars? No, that no, <laughs> but I remember, I don't know what happened to this. And I bet you don't remember. I remember when you could buy a little thing, it was like this big 
and you plugged it in via uh, a port. I don't know if it might have it might have predated USB, but you'd plug it into a port on your computer, and you <laughs> you could be at like the cookie website, and you could click on a particular cookie you were going to buy, and it, you let's say you clicked on. Uh, cinnamon sugar and the smell of cinnamon sugar would waft out of this little device or you could click on chocolate chip and the smell of a chocolate chip cookie would waft out of your device did you ever hear of this uh, yeah they've been, I, they've been I, they've been doing this since and the 80s well theaters yeah, smell vision smell a vision or something yeah, yeah, yeah. well okay why did that go nowhere because it's gimmicky. <laughs> and it's the same reason why like 3D in movie theaters like kind of like it's like it's like it's fun the first time. OK, but we and I know we're but not then you about, actually got to do sophisticated I know stuff we're not with talking it. about the metaverse and we're not talking about VR. But can you really have an immersive experience without smelling anything? Can yes. you really? How, I don't see how. If you are if you are snorkeling in the Cayman Islands, which I'm going to tell you, I have I've had the good fortune to have done that a couple times. It it smell. There's a you know there, this there's an olfactory experience. Uh, if you are standing by the on the shore by the ocean there's an olfactory experience no but here's the thing what i think the reason smell vision didn't work is there was like the you had like the chocolate chip cookie smell oh it was all but, it was all fake artificial and it but you also could you buy, could only do three of them right so it's like you could buy a panel that had you know this many little things, and yes. then there was a the scratch and stiff numbers. The, the bigger panel, you know, but yeah, but it don't you think this is going to have to be cracked? And if we really want to get to the metaverse virtual reality, I want. So I wonder if Facebook is anybody at Facebook that's uh, listening and but wants you, to. But write you can't. In. You can't. No, but you can't have smells on a headset. You could. No, it's just not sophisticated enough to have like in where the, you just in the future. In the future. It, could be, it could be a helmet and you could and it and you could have the air circulating and you could do the smell. I I think it's gonna happen. I think it's I think the problem is you cannot make smells on demand. I th I that's the problem. Uh, you can. You can you can that, have you can have like the caramel popcorn the smell at the mall. Yes. But like, but that's the only one you can do, right? It just can't be like, because what you would need is you need, here's a forest. Here's wait, a forest at 2 a.m. Here's a forest at 4 a.m. Yeah, you talk about the popcorn smell at the mall. Do you, there's a lot of s smelling stuff going on in retail. Well, I, under I understand. Popcorn. But the thing is, it's just that one, no, when right? You so you'd have to in, have like. When you walk into ho certain hotels, they have the smell in the lobby. It is a forest. And then they have the smell no, in the No, hallway. but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that each of those smells is a liquid. Yes, but right. If so, you like, you have the, to have. So you have to have your cap, but you'd need a capsule for each type, right? It's no, not like you can. You can they the in. The one that hooked up to the computer in the year 2000, uh -huh. it had an array of of uh, whatever it was, and they had the combine ability them. to combine them programmatically. It sent a message to combine them, and they had something like you know 750 different smells from this one little array, depending but that's, on see, the 750 programming smells. Set. That was twenty. You might, you might need, years ago. You might need seven hundred fifty million smells in Maybe order not to stimulate seven hundred fifty million. How many wide pixels variety. do you have on your screen now? To like do ten colors? million pixels. Right. 
So why couldn't you do the same with the smell? Eventually we well, will get there. You, you, no. you're scoffing at this. I think the difference is because there's a difference between uh, uh, digital uh, digital progress and and this is this is physical progress because now now you're making you are making. Oh, uh, I think you're wrong. You know, I you're, think you we're going to be making there. chemicals. I think you're going to. I, I think we're going to. There are so. I think we're going to be able to make chemicals on the fly. I think we already can. Uh, it's just whether it's worth it or not. I, you're wrong on this one. Prediction. On this He's one. wrong on this one. No, I will I think be I'm proven right. right. No. Uh, I'm going to say. The logistical complications of getting. Within of three making smells. years. <laughs> three years. Three what? years. Some of the VR things will be helmets and they will include sophisticated smells. <laughs> Okay. Everyone, three years. Oh my God, that is definitely Eight, not happening. March 2025. That is not going to happen. Yeah. I have said it on the air. I'm not saying there's March not going to be a Kickstarter project that eventually no, never ships. No, this will be, no, 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 no. This will be a, a real thing. I don't know if it'll be Meta that does it or Google or somebody else. Someone will do this. Yep. There was a um there's a very funny video where someone cuz when you play a video game when certain things happen that's just code so you can read that code and have it do stuff. Yeah. So um it goes way back to like the rumble sticks in like PlayStations like a bajillion years ago, right? Yeah. So like, you know, when a grenade blows up in the game like your you know, controller rumbles. Yeah. For that, ha ha you know, feedback, right? Yeah. Um, but at the time, they could just have, you know, your controller rumbled, which we don't have in the PC world. So this person endeavored to, like, make that happen and basically hooked various things up on his desk. Yeah. But, like, with these huge motors. So, like, so, like, if he, um, if he, you know, shot his, you know, weapon in the game. Yeah. And it was like a big weapon. Like the entire screen would fly off the desk. It was like dunk, kadunk, kadunk. Um, so I just I just imagine uh uh you know in the future uh would to make it to make it realistic, you know, when you uh when you get hit by something in VR, like there's like this big this <laughs> this this big hydraulic motor that flings you across the room or something. I just laughed. I I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah, it was it, it, it was a joke in the video and it's a joke here. OK, good. Hey, I w did want to mention if people are going all the way back to the beginning of our kind of the beginning of our conversation where we were talking about the the ergonomics of uh, the physical stuff, like, you know, how big should the dial be and how much should a quarter turn be and all of those things. Uh, if it, if if people that are listening are interested in learning more about that, the the book that, um, or the author or whatever that I loved, and I was looking for it on my bookshelf the other day, and I think I loaned it to someone a while ago, and I never got it back. Um, but the the one I recommend, I'm sure there's lots of good ones, is by Gabriel Salvendi. That's uh, Salvendi, S A L V E N D Y, and there's some newer edition. It's expensive and hard to get. Uh, there's some newer editions out. I kind of like the, the I had and I like the the older edition. Uh, it's called the Handbook of Industrial Engineering, um, and I thought that was a great. I used to like to just browse through the book for fun and that's, just look at the good. really, really just look at the measurements of things and I. I you know, I it was kind of like an anthropological view of the human, you know. So I I enjoy I enjoyed it for that reason. All right. Guthrie, what else about this topic did you wanna did you wanna cover? Um, ergonomics, industrial ergonomics. We didn't even start to cover any of this stuff. We I didn't get to talk about any of the uh, the, you know, the, like, like the degrees and the engineering programs and it's fine. 
Well, you can talk about it now. What did you want to talk about around it? Yeah, I mean, if you, there are, uh, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, yeah, there's. I think most people are getting like master's degrees in industrial. Uh, it's just design, it is industrial engineering. To sum up, it is yes. an interesting world because yes. it comes from the engine uh, engineering mindset. Yes, which is like we're talking about users, but not about humans. No, they um, are. They're uh, like these, like, no, stick, like the, no, like the human it. hand, you know? No, no. But what I was, what I was wanting to say at some point, and I don't think I did clearly, there is the physical aspects like the human hand, but in industrial engineering, there is also the cognitive aspect. So going back to that example about, you know, the plane and when someone's under stress. So I'm just, it's like physiological based it's like humans as a biological machine but it is often combined with biological plus cognitive right it's not just biological it is the cognitive or emotional element i mean even the things you were talking about like how fast should it respond no but i'm but i'm talking about like I'm not saying they don't do any of the same stuff, but like when we start from a traditional UX view, we start with what does the user want? You know, like who is this user as a person? What are their goals and ambitions? It's 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 very it's very much about like an individual, you know. Um, yeah, I hear as a I hear as a as a personality. Yeah. Whereas from the engineering side, they're trying to fix a problem. They're trying to solve yes. a problem using yes. the tools of engineering that good yes. engineers use all the time. So yep. even even if the goal is like, I want to be warmer, right? It's like, okay, well, the phys- like the or, or you were talking about the mental aspects, but those are physiological aspects, stress, you know, how does that affect decision making, yes. reaction time, yeah. like yes. that kind of stuff. It's not like, it's not as maybe I would say, consumer based as marketing based well no yeah n- yes i agree with you although but industrial maybe engineering can have a consumer base i mean how guthrie how long should the handle be on a bread knife okay that's industrial engineering it's a consumer product but it's industrial no, engineering no but i'm talking about and it's based the- on ha- the torque and the the angle at which you're holding it, and the and and how hard you have to that is industrial engineering for consumer products. So but I'm not. I'm talking doing, about how they're solving the problem, like they're coming at it from, from a, an engineering point of view. That's Absolutely. that's what I'm trying to say. Like and you I can apply that you, to, to. But all I this. didn't want you to think. I didn't want you to imply it wouldn't apply to consumer products because it does. Oh no! It mostly applies to consumer yes. products like cars. Okay. But it's okay. just like like it's the like. It's all based on engineering. The, it's based if, on, you know, may, yeah. may, maybe um, maybe uh, the difference would be uh, is, the fir- is the most important thing that the industrial engineer is doing when it comes to the bread knife. What's the color of the handle? Yeah, no, the most important thing. That right, like, like the color of the handle, the aesthetic, something that has nothing to do with the physical design I agree. the engineering of anything would right. be low on the list whereas maybe in the ux in what we would call the traditional ux community like that's sort of higher on the list yes right um, yes like what yes. are they you know like what are the preferences what is the psychological what's the most important thing to the users about a knife maybe right. it's the ergonomics dot 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 maybe it's the color Right. Right. Like well, whatever is the most important to the user, right. that's what we should focus on. I think yes. is maybe the difference. Yep. Whereas an industrial engineer is like, who, what is this, what is this biological creature and how can we make things for it? How can it be the most functional f- for the human? Which I like, I should just point out. But maybe, yeah, you, well, you always did like the engineering part. Yeah. So you, maybe you should get a copy of the Gabriel Selvendi book and, uh, Leaf through it, you might enjoy that. It's it's just it is um 
I mean, we've probably done this wrong because I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. Yeah. So maybe maybe we've misinterpreted the entire. Yeah, we probably just blew it and given everyone the wrong impression. But it's just I- it's just interesting to see how like. I've seen summaries like on a resume of like the products, right? And if yeah. you look at like someone who has like a master's in, you know, just UX, which they're not a lot of those programs, but they're out there. And it's sort of like, I don't know. It's, it's mushy in the way non-STEM fields can be. It's like very like, uh, it, it's very user centric. It's like- We would say it's complicated. We wouldn't say mushy. <laughs> Yeah, I but know. But I know exactly what you mean. You know, like I we, we talked to I the know. users and we I, figured I, out their I, pain points oh and the, the this He's thing. Made, and it's very, it's sort I of very. It. um. Guthrie, we, in case you haven't realized. I'm insulting it, everyone today. You're not only insulting everyone. This is like what we do for a living and you're making fun of what we do for a well, living. But that's okay. Like, I get it. Whereas like the engineering summaries <laughs> I know. are like, are like very. um. I know hard in some ways right it's like technical it's like uh you know um like analyzing dexterity in the you know pre-medical what a blah 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 you know and the thing and you know um i get it i don't know i'm doing you get it but no one else does i'm doing a terrible job explaining this you know that was my whole point of the entire podcast was to talk about this (laughs) distinction i'm pretty sure i failed (laughs) when we made the jump from industrial ergonomics to software ergonomics, the original jump was made with that level of precision. And we talked about things like, um, you know, there is research, for instance, on how large a target, like a button, needs to be on a screen in order to make sure that when people are moving their mouse, they don't overshoot the button, okay? And there is a formula. There's a formula, Fitz Fitz Law, there's a formula that will tell you how big the button should be. And it depends on how fast people are going to be moving it and the distance that they're moving it on the screen. So there... When, when we initially made the move from physical to digital, and I say we, you know, meaning, meaning, you know, human factors people, all of our work initially was based on that same level of engineering. It was based on what are the colors that people can really see and distinguish? And, and like I said about Fitz Law, and they were, there was all these other things. And then it kind of started morphing after that. But I just want to say originally people who did human factors in software were coming from coming from that same background. Mm-hmm. And, and then and it got and now diluted. it's evolved so far that it, that it it really does it feels like different. It does. And one of the things I'm surprised at is that sometimes when I'm mentoring people who are UX professionals who have master's degrees in, in, you know, from the human computer interaction programs, some of them don't know about some of this stuff that like the heart that they didn't, they're not learning it. It's like kind of disappearing. Uh, I I do think some people are like, wait, 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 wait. What if we applied the same (laughs) ideas that we use to design websites, but we just applied that to physical products too? (laughs) I hope what? No. Do you think that would work? (laughs) If we applied (laughs) the UX principles, but to but like Outside the digital realm. Okay, yeah, Has anyone ever thought of this? Oh, that's scary. <laughs> Someone's doing that. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Why uh, you don't want to lose your history. So I, I I only I only even even so like even like I'm looking at the like the the masters uh program, right? Yeah. So um Uh, you know, an MS in human-centered design and engineering. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, you look at the courses. You have, you know, human factors and ergonomics. There you go. Right? That's good. Um, so, like, you know, so here's here's the, U, the there there are two pieces to this curriculum, okay? Yes. Yeah. Us, the piece A is user experience design, and piece yeah. B is design and manufacturing. Yeah. Okay. So the piece B, the design and manufacturing. So these people are going to be learning stuff that like UXers do not have any experience in. So for example, you have TQM Six Sigma, yeah, vehicle ergonomics, yeah, yeah, automotive assembly systems, yeah. Oh. Digital manufacturing. Okay, so that's that's the that's the second piece of this master's. But yeah. even the first piece. Okay, user experience design. Yeah. All right. Think of if you were uh, going to create a curriculum in user yeah. UX design. Yeah. What would maybe be some of the you know give me like I, two or three classes. Uh, interaction I mean, you, design, design, user yeah. research, uh, okay. evaluation. So here here are the here are the. Uh, here are the cl- the courses, the required courses in this yeah. project at the University of Michigan. So uh, there's information visualization, okay, that's marketing good. management. No, that's not good. Yeah, understanding customers. Okay, yes. And then you have learning and memory. Yeah. Biological foundation of health psychology. Yeah. Sensation and perception. Yeah. And doing good. anthropology. I like it. It's a good. Hey, look, you can't learn everything in a master's program. No, no, no. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying like no, e- even good. even the, you know, so like when you're not learning about, you know, big data analytics and virtualization, which is one of the requirements, like when you're when you're doing um, less of the engineering stuff, even in yeah. the UX side, there's there they they touch on some of the marketing aspects. They kind of give you yeah. a sprinkle. Yeah, yeah. But you're getting but most of it job. is, you know, sensation and perception. Yeah, it's good. You know that kind, good. Of, that kind of stuff. So it's just a, it's just a totally different way of looking of, of looking solving these it. problems that maybe is better. Maybe I, it's I I'm with you on this, Guthrie. All right, listen, we got to stop. If people want to get hold of us, Guthrie, how can they? I do didn't that? explain any of this well. You did very well. It's okay. Let's, next week we'll do it again. Oh God, we have to do. This <laughs> We're going to pretend this one never you, existed. You want to do it over? We'll just, You're going to we'll start at the beginning. Your assignment. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, if people want to reach us, how can they reach us? Uh, you can email info at the Guthrie. Uh huh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you as well. I'm, I'm going to put you on a industrial engineering projects next. We're going to find one for you. Just for fun. Thank you, everyone. Thanks we'll for tuning in. Thanks week. for the messages. Bye.